Colombe. So just before we get to ask questions to Colombe, and I get the privilege of starting to ask the questions, and then you'll obviously get to ask all the questions you want, both about Colombe's journey, Vault, her vision for Europe. Um, I want to introduce Sigma a bit. So it's written in big, bold, gold letters uh, above me right now. But so um, the idea behind Sigma, which is a sort of new series of events podcast, it's not entirely sure um, the model that we're going to adopt. But the idea is to showcase young people who are tackling very, very difficult challenges. And the idea isn't so much to fetishize the fact that they're young, as much as it is to show that there are some very hard problems that can be tackled today by people who 10, 50 years ago would never have been able to tackle them. Um, and there's a variety of reasons that these um, problems can now be tackled by these individuals. You know, some of them are social. It's because despite what anyone might say, we've made a lot of progress as a society. Some of them are technological um, because despite, you know, all the downsides Facebook and other forms of social network may have, um, they've also enabled people who were marginalized, who didn't necessarily find their own kind um, in their local communities to connect with others around the globe um, and around their countries. And some of them is also social and economic. Um, for the first time, it's possible to leverage your own work, whether through content or through software, or through software, sorry, or through software, um, or through software. And instead of you know, having this constant pessimistic um, outtake on what the future of you know, technology and progress holds for us, um, I want to showcase people who are making, you know, take, willing to give up very easy careers or somewhat easy careers and take on super hard problems. Um, and so that's what brought me to Cologne for the first time. So um, one of our favorite entrepreneurs of the family was kept mentioning this girl that he was super impressed by. Um, and he always put, so his, his, what he loved to do was to say like, oh, I know this girl who's so much more impressive than any of the people you hang out with. And I was like, that's so annoying. Why don't I get to hang out with her? Um, yeah, the way, and he's here, by the way. So. Uh, and so after a while, I decided, well, you know what? I'm going to find an excuse to get this girl to hang out with us. Uh, and so now we're very lucky to have Colomb. So I'm going to give you a bit of context on uh, what Colomb is up to, and then we'll, we'll talk, uh, we'll get to, you'll get to ask your, uh, your questions too. Um, so Colomb is only 24, uh, but she's done quite a lot of stuff already. Um, she studied law at Warwick before moving on to pursue an LLM at Duke. Um, through that journey, she worked mostly on human rights initially, uh, both at the Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights Center or something, foundation, foundation. Um, and then at the Norwegian Refugee Council. And in, so she was already thinking about, so she was thinking initially, so that all, all of that was in the US and for a while she was thinking of moving back to London. Um, and then Brexit happened and that obviously changed her plans quite considerably. And on the day of Brexit, instead of complaining like most of the Europe, or sort of non-British um, Europeans that were living in London, um, instead of just complaining and doing nothing, writing a Facebook status and then going back to their norm her normal life, she decided that she was going to do something about it. Um, now, almost two years after starting Volt, um, they have members in over 32 countries, well, in 32 countries. Um, they're actually present as a political party in 12. They have over 20,000 members, um, 4,000 of which are committing more than five hours a week. And they have 100 people who've actually quit their jobs to work on this election. So, um, in addition to being head of policy at Vault Europe, uh, Colombe is also the sort of, with Louis, um, heading the list for Volt France in the upcoming European parliamentary election, um, which will happen in May, May, May. 26th. Go May 26th, so go and vote. Um, and yeah, so they're running in how many countries? So we'll be running in at least seven countries. The reason for which we want to run in seven countries is quite easy. We want to form an independent group in the Parliament. And to do this, you need to have 25 members of the European Parliament in at least seven countries. Most likely, because we don't think we'll just succeed straight away in seven countries, we'll run in 13 to 14 countries. OK, so um, before we move on to our questions, I get to ask a couple. And before we move on to vote, I actually want to know a bit about Colomb. Um, and I know Colomb is very humble and really doesn't like speaking about herself, and so I'm going to make her uncomfortable and ask her as many questions about herself as possible. I'm going to um, be uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, and then we'll ask more general questions that you're very used to answering anyway. Um, so before we start with Vault, I'd like to know a bit about you. So, um, you know, you're only 24, so school wasn't that long ago. Um, Duke was not that long ago at all, only yeah. two years ago. Um, what were you like at school? School, university or school? No, like, like high school. Um, very stubborn. I'm still very stubborn. Um, I think I was a bit annoying with my family, but extremely stubborn. I think would be the main uh, quite a few. I mean, yeah. What about with your classmates? 
uh, I hope friendly, nice. Uh, I mean, and I, I was pretty avid. And what about politics? So were you ever considering running for anything? Was that like the natural career path from day one? Um, never. Uh, I actually didn't like politics whatsoever. I always wanted to go into human rights. I'm very lucky that I knew very early on what I wanted to do. Um, and human rights, international litigation and criminal law um, was my thing. So I really liked terrorism, serious crimes, sexual offenses. It was my thing. Um, and so fighting governments or uh, defending um, people accused of having committed a serious crimes, never politics. And within three years, you're already no longer working on human rights. Or is Vault about human rights? So I think it's both. So I quit my job in human rights in August to do full-time Vault because it was just too much to do both at the same time. Um, and for me, Vault was a way to promote human rights in maybe a more effective manner than I was doing before as well. So it's not only about human rights, obviously. We have a very wide political program. But through Vault, you know, so when you work in human rights, you have to basically fight governments or try to convince them to do something that often they fundamentally don't want to do without any leverage whatsoever. Um, so I won a few cases and my clients are still in prison. Uh, you know, you manage to change a few laws and the same things sometimes happen. And sometimes you manage to get someone out or you manage to change something, but down the line it's up to politicians to actually put in the will to change anything. Can you be a bit more um, specific about the cases that you won yeah. where, you're, where so your clients are still in prison? I have a, um, so when I was working at the Kennedy Foundation, I work on Sub-Saharan Africa and Egypt. And I have a client who used to work for Al Jazeera as an editor, uh, who was in prison now three years ago um, on bogus charges. Um, you know, Al Jazeera is not allowed to operate in Egypt. He has his family in Egypt. He was visiting his daughter. He got arrested, um, tortured. Not working. Not working, visiting his daughter for Christmas, um, during the Christmas holidays. Um, tortured um, and never had a day in court. Uh, it's now been over three years. Um, and you know, you're not allowed to detain someone without enabling them to go to court in the first place. So we filed a case in front of the UN. Um, we won the case theoretically, uh, communications were issued, and Mahmoud is still in prison and still hasn't day, seen a day in court. So what does it mean to win a case at the UN then? It means that theoretically the government then should follow up and should free the person if you know, the detention is arbitrary. Um, and in practice, unless you have the US or a big power behind willing to actually push for it, it doesn't necessarily happen. So in other cases, when you had a dual citizenship, we got people out um, after years and years and years of negotiations. In this instance, it doesn't happen. And so for me, this was a huge frustration. You work so much on something and then it's actually read that it's, you know, it results in anything and people are still suffering as a result of it because of a lack of political will to change anything. And so frustrated with the UN, you decided to move to the most efficient institutions <laughs> of them all and now you're running for EU parliamentary elections. <laughs> yes, um, but not only. Volt is not only about the European elections. So the idea of Volt is basically to have a pan-European political movement. So which ones of you are not French in the room? No one? Everyone is French? A few non-French people? Okay, I bet that with some of you, um, we actually share many problems. Whether, so I'm French, I'm from Paris, uh, but that we share many problems, whether it's you know, finding a good job or finding affordable housing or being, having access to education, traveling and so on. We do share many problems. Yet, we have no party that actually represents us. So if you're German, Italian, Romanian or Bulgarian, we are part of a political union, but there's no political party to represent us. So the idea of vote was to find European solutions with one political party, and it doesn't exist right now in the European Union, to represent all of us, and then to also be active at the national and local levels. So we don't only want to be in the European Parliament. So what are the parties in the, in the European Parliament if they're not pan-European parties? So right now in the European Parliament, you have what we call groups. So the first time I saw this, I just, I wanted to bang my head against the wall. I didn't understand what it was about. You have groups that are called <laughs> ALDE, EPP, Greens, or whatever. And inside those groups, you have national parties. So, you know, En Marche, uh, Les Républicains, or whatever, will join a specific group with a different name in the European Parliament, with other national parties that have different national interests, different priorities, that often actually quite conflict quite a bit. So, for example, I'll give you a very practical example. The right wing in France normally joins the EPP, which is the right wing group in the European Parliament. You also have Orban in the EPP. When you vote for the right wing in France, you have no idea that you're actually voting de facto for Orban, because in the European Parliament they form the same group, so they pass policies with the hard right, which can also be more than Maybe right. give a precision of who Orban is, just so that people know. <laughs> so you have basically, I, I, I'm happy to talk more about Orban, but you have basically politicians and political groups that are way more hardcore, uh, whether it's on the rule of law, disrespecting it, uh, cr cracking down on civic space, cracking down on the judiciary, um, who are willing to compromise European values, which are, you know, democracy, um, the respect of the rule of law. Uh, less openly anti-Semitic. Yeah, also. 
um, and you have no idea that you're voting for this when you vote in France for uh, Les Républicains or others. And it just doesn't make sense. You can't expect citizens to think, okay, so I vote for my national party, but then they're gonna you know, fight with other national parties in a European setting that I don't fully understand. Um, so Volt is also an answer to change this. We have Volt Europa, which is a European organization, and then I'm also part of Volt France, uh, but we have Volt in 32 countries now. We go beyond the EU. And this is one of the things we want to change. When you vote for, or if you vote for Volt France, and I hope you will vote for Volt France, um, you actually vote uh, for the same program in Germany, in Italy, in Bulgaria. And so you know what you actually get yourself into. You don't just have a big manifesto that is very nice, a bit pro-European, a bit green, a bit social. You have very concrete policies, and you know what you get yourself into. And so, like, I think it's all good and well to have a pan-European party. Um, but it's quite, I mean, you know, I think the case for having coalitions of national parties is probably that people feel much more close to their national identity than they do to their European continental identity. And so before we move on to whether Europe even exists, really, um, I'd like you to tell me what it means for you to be European. Why do you feel European? So it's a complicated question. So I was lucky enough to study in the UK, um, where I met some of my best friends, you know, where I started my career and so on. And so I didn't feel I f I'm French, and I do feel French to a certain extent, but I also had this other culture coming in. But I think Europe just goes beyond this. I mean, I'm part of this union, where I can actually vote and elect people to represent me and that will have a political role. But at the end of the day, I'm not even sure the question is really, you know, do I feel European or not? I'm not sure I feel fully French, I'm not sure I feel fully Parisian either. Um, it's more what can I do for Europe and what Europe can actually do for me. Uh, and Europe can do many things for me, whether it's using European funds to create jobs. Um, you know, in France, uh, I was in the North of France a week ago, we started a tour of France. Um, and it's one of the regions with very high unemployment rates um, due to the fact that a few industries closed. I'm not sure you're aware, but you can actually redirect European funds um, to fund green projects. Um, we want to fund green projects, but to, to fund projects in general that will in turn create jobs. Right now in France, Louis told me today, um, we spent less than 18% of European funds and they expire in a year eight. and a half. One eight. Uh, one eight, yeah, 18th. Uh, it's, it's insane. I mean, they expire in 2020. We're losing them anyhow. Um, and we're not even using them to create jobs and so on. So I think Europe can actually do a lot for me, so to this extent, because I'm an individual that is a bit selfish at the end of the day. Um, you know, I feel European because I know that I can get something from it. Um, so two things. First, do you have an idea what the number was for the UK? Because they kept complaining that they didn't have enough money. Were they even using the, the EU funds? That's the first question. So I think no country actually uses the totality of EU funds. So I know that Italy still hasn't spent half of it um, in general, because it's also quite administrative uh, and it's complicated, of course, it's the EU. So it's very complicated to use the funds, which is one of the things we want to change. Uh, but no country has used all EU funds. And I want to touch upon something you mentioned. So you said, I don't know, you know, I don't know if I feel Parisian, I don't know if I feel French, I don't know if I feel European. And you know, um, I think that's something that's very shared amongst a lot of people in this room. It might be shared amongst you know, a lot of people in London, in a lot of, amongst a lot of people in Berlin, in Munich. And you know, just like I think that with En Marche, there's increasingly a sentiment that it's not really a party that represents anyone but some form of cosmopolitan elite. Do you not have the feeling that with this sort of giving up on national roots, you're creating a party for the positively disenfranchised? So I don't think we're giving up our national roots. I think we have many differences with our march that I'm very happy to get in. Um, but I don't think we're giving up on national roots. So first of all, I don't represent Volt Foodie. Um, I'm one person, we have 20,000 members that come from literally, you know, every sector of society, every economic background, we're in more than 400 cities. Um, so we have people from everywhere on the continent. Um, but then it's not because we are pro-European and we are pan-European that we give up on national roots. We'll have a French program for the French elections. We'll have local programs for the local elections. It just means that when it comes to Europe and to the European elections, we want to provide European solutions. So b before we move on to the European program and how Vault functions, um, you know, something is pretty striking, how young you are for a politician. Um, most people that you're surrounded with probably don't care about politics at all and don't really even understand how the European Parliament works. Um, why do you think that is? Why are they so depressed and cynical about the prospects of politics? Um, so I think one part is on the European Union. It's extremely hard to understand how the EU actually functions, what it's about. Um, most people around me don't even know there's a European election coming up. And honestly, if I wasn't part of Volt, I probably wouldn't know either. Um, there's very bad communication around it, um, and it's just, it's such a complicated uh, system. I mean, I'm still often, when I look at it, banging my head against the wall, being like, how does it actually work? What can I actually do? Um, so I think there's a few elements to it. First of all, we need to simplify the system, but second, people don't feel like they have a voice in the European Union, which is something we want to change, but it's, I think, also often the case at national level. People don't feel like they can actually participate. 
And so the reason for which personally I never joined an existing party before, you know, I could have joined Marche or any other party before this, but started to create um, votes was because I thought, in, indeed I'm very young uh, and I'm also a woman, that I would never have had a real voice in any other political party. So I would probably have been able to come, sit in the back, listen, try to raise my hand once or twice, uh, you know, propose something and wait to grow older uh, to be able to have a real voice, which is, you know, I said at the beginning, I'm very stubborn, I don't like to wait, I, I want to be able to express myself. Um, and so this is one of the things we wanted to change with Volt by enabling people to participate. But I think it's also what needs to change in politics in general and in the European Union. Citizens don't get how they can participate. And you have concrete ways to participate in EU democracy. So I don't know if you're aware, but you can actually file a European citizen initiative, which is, yeah, so I didn't know. No idea on any of this. Me neither before. So you can actually file it and it's, you can propose for the commission to review um, a proposal that is in its competence and it might one day propose it to the European Parliament. The threshold is one million uh, signatures, so it's insane. Uh, but you have ways theoretically to participate. Coming from different countries. Coming from at least seven countries, I think, with different threshold. I mean, it's overly complicated once more. We need to simplify it. But you have a few ways to participate in European democracy. Uh, we want to enable people to participate more, and I don't mean direct democracy and referendums. I mean, for example, uh, you know, citizens' assemblies, what's used in Ireland, it works really well. Or in Italy, before any piece of legislation is actually introduced, citizens get to comment online with their ideas. And it's not only to pretend to have a fake debate, like some of the things that are happening in France right now, but it's also so that you have more creative solutions at the end of the day, um, and you have positive feedback. And in general, pieces of legislation actually improve when citizens um, put their opinions and give their advice. Um, so when we were talking earlier, I asked you how long do you think you're going to stay in politics and you replied, God, hopefully not too long. Um, I feel like every politician that ever spoke to anyone said the same thing. Why should we trust you when you say you're not going to run for president in 20 years? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, so I think first of all, I'm not sure you should trust me because I don't necessarily like politics or because I don't want to stay in politics. I think you shouldn't trust me blindly ever. I don't believe in trusting people blindly. You should read the program we put out. You should read our values and see whether you like it or not. It's not about me. It's never been about me and it will never be about me. Um, Volt is about the thousands of members we have. It's about the, the way we do politics and the ideas we have. So you shouldn't, I mean, I'm very happy if you trust me and if you like me, but you, you shouldn't just trust me. It's never been about this. Um, about presidents, uh, I mean, if you don't trust me but trust the program, it's not whether I'm running one day. On a personal level, um, I love human rights. It's my passion. It's always been my passion. This has been a way to create something that I think was deeply needed, a pan-European movement, whether it's us, you know, or we create a model that can later be used. Um, but it's not... That's a great quote from Andrea saying that if you fail, at least you'll show that it's possible to start something like that. Yeah, exactly. And from the inside, we actually show that the EU can work. You know, we're from more than 32 countries with people. Our members actually range from the age of 14 to 92. And we do manage to find solutions and common policies. So we show that to a certain extent it works. And we show that there's a new way of doing politics where people can actually participate in decision making and so on. I hope we'll succeed and I think we will. And I think it's needed right now and not in 10 years because of what we see right now in France, but across the continent with um, the rise of extremists and so on. Uh, but for me, I did this because I kind of had to. Um, you know, there's a few voters in the room. We call people involved voters. There's a few voters in the room. Um, Nicely misleading because it sounds like voters. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> um, but until very recently, uh, they all know I didn't want to become a candidate for the European elections. I just really didn't want to. And a few of them had to convince me personally to do it. Um, I didn't think I would necessarily be the best person at first. Uh, but I also, it's not what I enjoy doing in my life uh, necessarily. Now it's also a lot of fun to meet lots of people and do those events. But you know, the idea of being 24, going in front of crowds, um, taking a lot of hits in the face, like you normally do in politics, um, and so on, when I had a career that I also loved, wasn't necessarily what I wanted to do. So you've been touring Europe quite a lot. I think now you're focusing mostly on France, but before we sort of dig into France, I want, I want you to speak about Europe. Um, I sort of hinted at it earlier. Like, there is this question of European identity and whether it actually exists. You know, until recently, women's rights were essentially non-existent in Ireland. Um, I think the French and the British have very different understandings of what the role of the state should be. Um, I think that we don't have the same approach to education when you're German or when you're Hungarian. Across that trip, what sort of came back as the most recurring values or the most recurring understandings of what both Europe should provide as an institution and what it means to be a European? 
So basically the way we function and the way we create it, just for those of you that don't actually know Vault, um, is we had people that reached out to us and decided to create a local Vault um, chapter or a national one, and then often um, some of the key team members, so those that invested the most time, uh, would go to help do the first event, uh, which is sometimes an event like this, but with two or three people, um, and where you recruit one person that in turn will recruit a few others. Um, so I did quite of those first few events with very few people. And the thing that did come back wasn't necessarily about you know, what the European institutions should look like because no one, unless you, you work on this, yeah, exactly, no one thinks about this and very few people actually care um, in the normal population outside of the Brussels bubble. Uh, but it was more, you know, okay, so I'm Hungarian. It's like a very fun place, the Brussels bubble. <laughs> Well, Brussels is also very nice outside of the bubble, but yeah. Um, but, you know, it was more like, okay, I'm Hungarian, and I feel like, you know, I have many similarities with you, um, sometimes more than with other people in my own countries, we face similar problems, how can we bring uh, European solutions? Because when you do talk about ma problems that actually matter to people, including climate change, migration, you know, fiscal evasion, and so on, um, it goes beyond the nation state. We do need European solutions, and we've seen that it doesn't work as it's going right now. And so then people are like, okay, we actually need to work together to find the solutions. And I'm willing to compromise, I'm willing to sit down and discuss this for as many hours as it will, as it will take to come out with a common solution. So for me, it wasn't a study of value. I mean, you do have the values that in Europe we have a democracy that shouldn't be, you know, we, we, we often take it for granted, but when you see superpowers next to us and so on, it's, it's, you shouldn't take it so much for granted. And this comes back very often, uh, but it's also... You know, we have survivors of World War II that became active in politics at the age of 92 in Volt. Uh, we have students that are very afraid... Tell that us going... about him or her. So he's a guy from the Netherlands. Um, I met him with his son at one of the funding events. Um, and it was actually... I cried. He, he was babysitting his 70-year-old son. No, no, he's... <laughs> he was coming with his son as a joint activity. He also has grandsons. <laughs> he wasn't babysitting. <laughs> He wasn't babysitting his 70 years old son. Um, no, but it was, I actually cried a bit when he, said, when he told that story. So he's 92, and he's a survivor of World War II, um, and he was never involved in politics before, like most people involved. So 70% of our members were never involved in politics before. And I was like, okay, so why? I mean, I'm very happy that you're here, but why? Um, and he told us, look, uh, I've been through traumatic experiences during the Second World War, and now I see the continent going in a way which really scares me for the first time again. So, you know, it was, he started getting involved just a bit after Brexit. Um, but you had uh, in Poland um, a crackdown as well. You had uh, in France Marine Le Pen going up. And you had so many other instances that he was actually feeling like we might reiterate the mistakes of the past. And he said, I just don't want to leave this for my son, my grandsons, and so on. I only know about grandsons, not granddaughters. So that's why I'm saying this. But it's not only a family of mine, I'm assuming. <laughs> Um, and what about France? So you started um, your tour of France. You started with the northern region, and I don't know how advanced you are in that tour. Uh, but I'm wondering if, you know, just like in Europe, you have uh, in different places similar issues coming up and similar opportunities. I'm wondering if you have the same thing and whether when you go around, you're like, do you meet people who are like, oh, finally someone who's coming out of Paris um, and who's thinking about slightly different issues or if people are actually like, oh, we have no identity, you know, we don't relate at all to what's happening in Paris. Like how fragmented is it? Um, are the issues the same? Are the opportunities the same? So first of all, I'm lucky not to be um, the only one on the list. So I have Louis, who's from a small village outside of Cognac uh, in Charente. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why you're laughing, but <laughs> yeah, it's true. Um, and so For we people who don't know France, Google it. <laughs> I don't know the name of the small village, but it has 100 <laughs> inhabitants apparently. So. Um, so it's not only me from Paris, I also have Louis, who's um, on top of the list uh, and also represents a different vision of, of, of France in itself. Um, but one thing, so I was actually very scared of this when we started, to be completely honest. Um, I didn't know if people would be able to relate and, and you know, how the dialogue would go in France. Also because I, I did study abroad and I, I didn't know how people would be able to recognize themselves in me in a certain way. Um, and we are pro-European, which in France is often very scary. So France is one of the quite Eurosceptic <coughs> countries. Uh, so the word pro-European is not necessarily the best one. We, we do lead with this, but it's not necessarily the best one to lead with in France. Um, and often we had people that came in a sometimes a bit of a defensive way to our events. So again, it's a meetup like in a bar with five chairs and we talk to people. Um, and one thing that I found though is when they told me, okay, I don't like Europe or, you know, I'm, I, I don't understand how this is going to help. I think we have, for example, we're in North of France in Calais, um, Lille and Dunkerque um, two weeks ago. You know, why are we left alone with uh, migrants? Uh, it's been going on for 20 years. We're not getting any help. And then when you, you actually look at those individual problems and explain, so one, listen, and second, explain how uh, Europe has a role in solving this. 
So when you talk about migrants in Calais, uh, indeed the situation has been going on for 20 years, and indeed it's absolutely abnormal um, that people are left in inhuman conditions um, in Calais, but also that the local population is confronted um, with such influx. Right? We should deal with it in a European manner. And this is what everyone said, you know, the European Union is leaving us alone here, but they're also leaving alone in Italy, Spain, Malta, and a few other places. And we need European solutions. So even if people didn't necessarily believe in the European Union... Because there, there is a European solution in theory, right? Yeah, but it doesn't work. So there's the Dublin system, basically, when you come in, so your point of arrival is the country in which you're supposed to stay. Um, but it's already super fair. It's so fair, right? Because you can get in Europe in so many ways. <laughs> I mean, it's a bit, it, it, it's, it was doomed to fail. Um, and then uh, they also take you, so if, if you get controlled, they also take your fingerprints. Um, and so whenever then you get to another country, often if you claim asylum and it's rejected, you go, you, you send back to the country. So for example, we met an Ethiopian migrant who's been in Calais for more than a year. He tried to cross a few times. Um, he speaks perfect French. He studied um, in uh, Lyon at one point, I think, uh, in the past before coming. Um, and he was saying, he said something which really shocked me, or, or really stayed with me. He said, I'm the slave of my um, fingerprints. Uh, je suis slave de mes empreintes. Which only applies um, under the Dublin system. And it just doesn't work. So wh what, what did he actually mean by that? So basically, he, he arrived in Germany, um, and he didn't speak German, and uh, he felt like there were many... Um, racist instances against him in Germany. He felt like he wanted to stay in France because he spoke French or England because he spoke English, uh, where he could actually you know, integrate and uh, start a new life. But every time he tried, he would be sent back to Germany. Um, but Germany is one of the good examples. You know, most people arrive in Italy, or right now in Spain, actually. It's the majority of arrivals, um, and w which is unfair not only to, to migrants to, to stay there, but also to the Italian people. You can't expect one country to deal with all of those refugee, fl uh, refugee flows, right? Mm. Um, so this is when the Dublin system just doesn't work. We ask, we're supposed to be solidar, we're supposed to work as one union, yet we ask a few countries to deal with migrations on their own. Uh, it's the case of Italy, and we saw it with Emmanuel Macron, who uh, a, few, a few weeks ago, a few months ago, I'm losing track of times during the campaign, but a few months ago um, said um, to Italy that they were very inhuman for not accepting people uh, and for not opening their ports. I don't know if you remember, but we do have ports on the Mediterranean. Um, people can actually come to Marseille. Uh, uh, the port has been closed for, since July 2017 to migrants, but people can actually come in uh, to Marseille. It's not just in Italy. Um, and it, of course, really pissed up Italian people. Uh, Salvini actually went up like 5% in the polls following this, of course. Uh, but it's also very unfair. You can't expect a few countries to deal with problems um, that could also be opportunities, and uh, the rest to you know, sit back, relax, and wait for it to pass. And so it's not just on um, how we handle migrants that Europe has a lot of differences. Like, I was reading some of your articles, and it's crazy how different the rules are country by country when you're operating as a political party. Um, and I just want you to talk a bit about that because, yeah, it's just insane. Yeah, so again, we're supposed to be a political union, right? But we... So th there's a few things that are a bit abnormal about European democracy. We're supposed to be a political union. When you vote, because you will all vote in May um, for the European elections, you vote for a parliamentarian that will theoretically represent you. Yet this parliamentarian will not be able to propose uh, pieces of legislations. Uh, it's not in the power of the European Parliament, which would be insane. Like if I said this, you know, parliamentarians in France can't propose uh, pieces of legislations, you would be like, what? Uh, Who's supposed to do that? Exactly, like, you know, I vote for you to propose legislations and to represent me, but you can't do it. So there's already at the European level quite a few things that are not very logical that we need to reform, but then also in the rules of operations. So since the Second World War, I believe that it was to stop outside interference into, into different countries' politics, um, and, and before the European Union didn't exist, but you can't have a European political party. So how we function, we, we basically created an association uh, that we incorporated. We're very hybrid. Uh, we're trying to adapt to a system that is against us at first. Um, but Volta Europa is not a political party because European political parties can't exist. So we have to create national political parties. The last European political party didn't go well. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, the last European political party is what? The, the Nazis, Nazi Germany. Uh, yeah, so it didn't go so well. Uh, yeah. Um, but so, so you have to create national political parties to be able to operate um, as a political party and to be able to run for the European elections. Uh, so we already created 12, but imagine having to create uh, political parties in different countries. It's, it's a huge burden. In some countries, it's actually really hard to create. Uh, in France, it's not the easiest job either. And then once you have a political party, so we have 12 with different uh, you know, ways to apply, 
you have lots of different ways of operating. So I can tell you quickly about France, but then there's some even more normal countries. Um, so in France, for the European elections, we have a threshold of 5%. It means that you elect at least four to five parliamentarians or no one, which is a bit insane. Like, if I'm elected, I don't need to go with four friends to the European Parliament. I can go meet other parliamentarians and work. I don't need four other people in the first place. Um, it, yeah. And it's a way to kind of stop small parties as well from being elected in the first place and from um, representing citizens. It was, by the way, deemed unconstitutional in Germany. They had a similar rule um, four years ago because it's against the principle of, you know... And it was even lower threshold. Yeah, it was 3%. Um, and the Constitutional Court said that it was against the principle of equality of chances and equality of votes. So if you vote for me uh, and I don't pass the 5%, uh, you, my seat will go to another party that you didn't vote for. Um, so it's a bit insane, uh, but that's not the only thing. So for example, for those of you that are not French and that went to vote in the past, you probably had a unique ballot, which means that you had the, list, the names of political parties and you ticked a box and then you put it in the ballot box. In France, when you go to vote, it's not like this. You have lots of different ballots, little squares, with the name of the political parties, sometimes a face, different colors. You pick at least five, you put one in the box, and the other four you throw. So first of all, it's a huge ecological cost, which is a bit insane in this period of time. Um, but then it also means who actually pays for those ballots in the first place. Well, guess what? It's political parties. So political parties have to pay for the printing and the distribution of ballots. So for a small political party it's and a new political party, it's extremely hard. It's at least 800,000 euros. And, uh, just in France? Just in France. Because this, this is not a rule everywhere. Normally you have a unique ballot. In, I think it's all countries but one in Europe, and I'm not sure which one, um, have a unique ballot. Apart from France. Oh, sorry, but yeah, apart from France. I think it's Sweden, but I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, otherwise, it's a bit dumb to print so many papers. It means that at least 90% of them are wasted then that you throw in the trash. Uh, it makes absolutely no sense. And it's another barrier to democracy in the first place in France. But then you have other rules. So, you know, our Italian chapter is one of the most promising ones for a very simple reason. The situation is so horrible, uh, and there's no one representing, uh, you know, progressive Italians at the moment, that we grow very quickly, and we get a lot of media attention. So it's one of the countries where it's actually fairly easy to grow. Yet, to be able to run in the European elections in Italy, uh, you need to collect 150,000 signatures, but not only this. It has to be by hand, and you need a notary presence for every single one of the signatures. Imagine, so we're doing it, we're trying to do it, um, and we're collecting more and more every weekend, but imagine the huge, first of all, it's super expensive, but then it's a huge, it's, it's really a huge pain. Um, you have other countries that ask to collect signatures, like Germany, but it's 4,000, and then you have no threshold. And so we're seeing more and more of this across different countries where you have just absolutely insane different rules that uh, when we're supposed to be operating as one. And one last one that I can give, I'm 24, so I can run in France. I couldn't run in Italy or Greece, for example, because you have to be 25. In other countries, I think you can sometimes be 16. You have such different rules, it's, you know, we need to harmonize those and to make it more easy for people, first of all, to present themselves in the first place, but then also to be able to vote for the parties that will represent them eventually. Yeah, so the, the barriers to entry, honestly, in politics, national or European, are just absolutely crazy. Like, how are you even going to pay the, thousand, the hundred thousands of you know, euros of ballots that you're going to be sending if you don't have a bank account? Because you don't have a bank account. Yeah, that's another thing. <laughs> so there's also some positivity in all of this, I promise, and it will come later. Um, but because uh, financing laws in France for political parties are so strict, banks uh, automatically um, refuse you. And it's, it's not just us. Uh, you know, even on March, had lots of difficulties to open a bank account. The FN, it's a bad so example. The, the, the minister of the economy struggled to open a bank account for his political party. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was actually quite tough. But then, you know, he came with a huge personal loan, so it helps when you come with a few millions to open a bank account. Um, I unfortunately probably will not get such a loan, so it will be a bit, a bit more complicated. Yet, <laughs> when you're a very recognized human rights lawyer, maybe. Uh, yeah, we'll see. Um, but it's harder to open a bank account. But so most political parties go through this in the first place. You get refused, you get refused, you get refused. And banks don't actually issue letters saying that they reject you. They do it by phone. Because once you have a letter, the Banque de France is obligated um, to assign you to a bank within 24 hours. Uh, so, when so you're like the kids when you're assigning the teams to play football that no one wants exactly. and they send you to a random team. Yeah, but it's team. not just us. It's also office, by the way. <laughs> um, but yeah, and it's, it's one of those very difficult things. So we've been trying to open a bank account for now five months. Um, we've been rejected from 30 banks. Um, we've been in processes with the Banque de France for four months. It takes forever. We had yet another meeting this morning. Um, and, you know, we'll have other and others and others. And we finally have two banks that are looking promising um, and, and that haven't rejected us um, at first, but so it's really complicated to open a bank account, and we've been talking to new parties across France, and it's the same for everyone, it's really hard. 
Um, but then once you also have a bank account, you have limits. So you can only raise 7,500 euros per fiscal household, per fiscal year. Um, so to get to um, 800,000, you need at least 106 people that give you, uh, you know, 7,500. So if you want to, uh, I welcome you to help us. But apart from this, you know, it's really hard to actually get to this point. Where do people make the transfers then to your personal bank account for now? <laughs> No, we can't yet start. <laughs> Once we have a bank account, don't worry, you'll see it on Facebook when we actually have it. Um, so, you know, um, it feels like there's a lot of political startups in France now because we had En Marche and they marketed themselves as a political startup and you just mentioned how high the barriers to entry are and so at the family we help entrepreneurs and so that's, you know, high barriers to entry, shitty systems is something that we have to deal with quite a lot. Um, and I think that's sort of clouded some of the difficulties that you've been facing as Vault compared to what Omash might have been facing. And so there's several things that I want to you know, ask you about uh, on that. One is people sort of tried to associate your image to the Omash image, um, and I'd like you to sort of distinguish the two. Um, the second is that unlike Omash, you started with essentially no superstar politician. Um, and i just like to know why that is, because that seems like an easy growth hack for a political party. So first, on how we differ from Amar, so I'll start by the internal organization and then um, by the political views. Uh, so for the internal organizations, one of the fundamental things about vote is that we want to be very democratic and participatory. So if you join today, and I hope all of you will join today, you will have exactly the same voice than mine. So you'll get an equal right to vote, an equal right to propose policies, you'll know how decisions are made, you'll be part of the decision-making processes. For me, it's one of the reasons that pushed me to create um, vote, and it wasn't necessarily linked to our march at first. It's just I knew that if I joined any party, I wouldn't be able to <coughs> vote on policies or propose my own ideas, and I had many that I wanted to propose. Um, so internally, democracy is very important. We believe in democracy, we advocate for democracy in our program for participatory democracy. So let's lead by example and actually apply it to ourselves instead of asking others to do it in the first place. Then we are indeed not centered around a superstar or one person. And this was very important to us um, because, you know, Emmanuel Macron at one point said in his campaign, I think, it's not when someone asks him about the program and the lack of program, it's not about the program, it's about the man. Um, and for me, that's everything that's wrong in politics in the first place. It's not about the man. You don't govern alone. You know, if I'm elected, even as a parliamentarian, you have a team behind you. You have people that you consult. Uh, it's about actually your ideas, your policies, and what you want to put into action. So we wanted to make sure that, first of all, we had content, um, and that you know, we were structured in a healthy, democratic manner. Then on political positionings, um, on La République en marche is more pro-European than many other parties. So for this, this we, we really welcome, um, and it's something positive. But it's also a bit easy to say that you're pro-European and it's different to apply it to yourself, right? So for example, I gave the Salvini example and asking Italy to take in migrants. For me, being pro-European is accepting that we're in this together and finding solutions in common and working together. Being pro-European for me is not saying, okay, so you know, let's find a solution to the refugee crisis. It's not a crisis, but that's the, use, the word that, um, that uh, Emmanuel Macron uses. Um, so you guys welcome people and we don't take them in. That's not being pro-European or you know, uh, nationalizing a French company when an Italian one wants to take it over. That's not really being pro-European. Um, so on the pro-European side, we also defer a bit, and then on policies, I, I guess on entrepreneurship and other topics like this, we are more similar to Amash, but then we have very strict fundamental values, including the respect of the rule of law and of human rights. Um, and so we would never be able or accept to pass a law such as the immigration one that shortens asylum procedures in such a way that uh, asylum seekers can actually be deported before they finish their appeals to countries where they risk their lives. Um, or to the state of emergency one where, you know, during his campaign, I actually went to see him. I really wanted to believe in En Marche. I really wanted to join En Marche. My whole family joined En Marche. Um, and I was like, maybe I can actually join En Marche and not have to create a party and stay in human rights. Um, and I went to see him. And um, one of the questions that was asked in the room was, what do you think of the state of emergency? And he said, you know, it's an abnormality, and it's not normal to stay in a state of emergency for over two years. It's an emergency, it's not a continuous thing. You know, we need to respect national, um, we, we obviously need to uh, protect national security, but we need to respect human rights and so on. So what I expected from this wasn't to then pass the state of, of emergency into, into common law. And, you know, allow uh, police raids without judicial warrants or things like this. So on, on the social aspect, on human rights, and on the rule of law, we're quite different, because this is at the core um, of uh, our identity. And the last point is uh, we're based on content. So we voted on a program in October. Um, you can go and consult it. I hope you'll like it. If you don't like it, at least you know what we stand for and you know not to vote for us. Um, you know, you have concrete policies that you can read. You can see if you identify with them. If you identify with the majority and not with the rest, you can come and propose amendments. Um, but you know what you're getting yourself into. We're not campaigning based on a man or a woman, but based on content policies and uh, the movement as a whole. 
So there's two things I want to I want to point out. So the first is you know you keep insisting that you're pan-European, um, and I know that you sort of detached yourself from the founding trio. There are three of you uh, that started Volt. Um, you're French. Andrea is Italian. The last one's German. If I'm yeah. if I'm not wrong. Um, and how do you sort of avoid the trap that most of the European coalitions seem to have fallen in of essentially reverting to the interest of the founding part, the founding countries of, uh, of Europe. So how do you include uh, you know, Central and Eastern Europe? How do you include the Nordics in these discussions? Because population-wise, they're small. Um, in terms of representation in the European Parliament, they're minority countries. Um, so how do you include those people in their problems? Um, so that's the first question. The second is you mentioned that if people join, um, if people join Volt today, they have the exact same um, say that you do in determining policy and strategy. How do you avoid being hijacked? Because you know it could be a tempting thing for a couple of people who have slightly more extremist view than you on some topic to come in and say, okay, well, there's only 4,000 of them really active. If we put 2,000 crazy people in, maybe we can take control of the party. Yeah. So on the first question, um, first of all, some of our biggest chapters are actually uh, in the East. So Bulgaria and Romania are some of our big countries involved. It's not, you know, it's just people joined, very active people that develop the chapters very quickly. But to make sure that every single country has a voice, and it's not only the founding trio or, you know, Western Europe, but also, for example, that Luxembourg has a voice. We have a very active team in Luxembourg. Obviously, the number of people is going to be less than the German ones. Um, we created a um, council of regions um, where basically right now it's the presidents and vice presidents of every country. On the long term, it will most likely be representatives of every country that are directly elected seats and where they can discuss things like alliances and so on that impact the entire movement. But then when you join as well, you have a double membership. So you have a membership, I have a membership to vote France and vote Europa, but which means that, for example, a Bulgarian member that joins will be able to vote on policies, will be able to propose policies. Um, so that's a way to include everyone and to make sure that no country is completely underrepresented and that everyone has a say on what impacts them. Um, I forgot your second question. The second question was about being hijacked. Okay, so when we started Vault, one of my big worry was, you know, we're creating something pan-European. As you said, the last time it was done wasn't so great. Um, let's make sure that we don't create a complete monster. So we actually spoke to many people when we created Vault. We spoke to the Pirates Party um, because they function quite well online and we function also online. We wanted to see what worked. But just explain what the Pirates Party is. It's a, par yeah. uh, it's a party that is present, I think, in 14 countries. They had good results in Iceland, not so much um, every, everywhere else. They're quite, local, they're quite active at the local level as well. Um, I think their core policy is transparency and fight against corruption. Um, and they have a kind of pan-European spirit. Um, it, it's, it's a quite different animal, but it was very interesting to speak to them and to see what worked and didn't work. And then a more controversial example is we actually spoke to the founder of the far-right party in um, Germany. And the reason for this is quite simple. The guy is not far-right. He's anti-Euro, uh, he's not anti-migrant, he's not anti-Europe, he's just an economist that didn't believe in the Euro. However, from the moment he started this and said, okay, I'm anti-Euro, I'm starting my own party, anti-Euro for the rest, more or less, you know, acceptable. Um, there was a type of amalgam that was created and suddenly you had a bus of like 3,000 people that came to the first General Assembly, outed him and uh, started passing absolutely insane policies. Um, and so for me, creating a pan-European movement, I was like, okay, we need to ensure that it doesn't go completely in one extreme or another, that it needs to stay safe. And so we created um, free checks whenever you create policies. Um, and it's meant also to avoid crazy situations like this one. The first one is any member, so if you join, you'll be able to propose a policy. It has to be evidence-based. So if you have evidences in the field, you have to include them. So for example, if you know, Louis, it's not the case, I'm sorry to pick on you, but if Louis doesn't believe in climate change, he does believe in climate change, um, he can't just come up and say, okay, uh, I don't believe in climate change, this is the policy. You know, evidence shows widely that climate change exists, uh, we thus need to fight it, so he can't propose this. The second, exam the second check is best practices. We don't pretend we know everything, I really don't know everything, know that we want to reinvent everything. Um, what we want to do as well is take what actually works in other countries and implement it and learn from it. So of course when you're a na national politician, it's really hard, for example, for Emmanuel Macron to say, oh, the Germans do it so much better, we're going to use their model and copy it. It wouldn't be perceived very well. As a pan-European movement, it's different. We can actually acknowledge that other countries are really good on some things and others in others and use it. So a concrete example, we want gender equality. You know, quotas on the, on the board of, um, of uh, Public publicly listed companies in Germany, thank you, actually works really well. Or Iceland that has a certificate of equality works really well. So we use this. And then the What's final the certificate check, of equality? I think, so basically, um, in Iceland, companies have to themselves show uh, that they paid equally men and women throughout the year. 
um, and to get a certificate with the government at the end. So it's on them to actually show it. It's not on the government or on... To check. Exactly, to check. And it works really well. Um, so you have different practices like this. Or the Italian uh, parliament, when you run for the parliament, they have to have gender alternate list. So in France, if I'm not mistaken, you know, we have to have gender alternate list, so not a man and a man, but a man, a woman, a man, a woman, and so on. Or a woman, a man, a woman. Exactly. But for the European elections, not for the national or local, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. In Italy, it's not the case, and it's a really good uh, measure, so we want to extend this to um, the whole European Union. And the last check, because I tend to think always in case of a worst-case scenario, so, you know, evidence and best practices um, could be misconstructed. So, for example, if you take the death penalty, uh, there's evidence that when you try to kill someone, you kill them. Um, and best practices, what well, was used is still used in America and is still used in, quite a, in the United States and in a few countries. So you could say, okay, let's implement this. So the last check, it's a, it's a values check, and it's a pretty basic one, but I think it's extremely important in today's world. It's basically the respect of the rule of law and of human rights, which again, you know, it's not imposing everything, which means that you wouldn't be able to pass any measure. It means you can't discriminate against others. You respect the right of life and so on. And so this was a way to ensure that we don't go, you know, far right, far left, or in any crazy direction. And there's something else, something else that I came across. Um, so you said that you no policy could go against what you called your fundamental values. Yeah. And within your fundamental values, you referred to the vulnerability check. And yeah. I thought that was a super cool concept and I'd love if you could detail yeah. that a bit more. So we use this in policy, but not only in policy, we use this in any discussion we have now. So basically, whenever creating a policy, we always look at the people it would impact the most. Um, and so it's in policies, but for example, in events, so if we talk again, I'm a woman, so it's easier to speak about it, about gender equality. We'll always try to let women or third genders speak first to be able to detail their ideas, because often when you talk about a policy, minorities tend to be, you know, um, spread aside uh, during a debate. So during a vulner vulnerability check, we always check how this will impact um, the people that are more vulnerable in general, um, to make sure that we don't leave people behind. And the people who are actually most impacted by yeah. the policy in particular rather than just the general net yeah. impact. Um, who actually checks? So you, you said like, we check that it, you know, that it's evidence-based, we check that it's a best yeah. practice. W who's we? So right now it's the policy team, but you have a right that is appointed, the policy team, but you have a right of appeal to the board um, and to the Council of Regents. If you're not happy with the policy, we actually never had to reject a policy so far. For a few, I had to say, okay, you actually didn't add any evidence, so can you, you know, we know evidence exists, but so people made a lot of fun of me at first. If you, we have a program for the European elections, but we also have a mapping of policies, which is a 212 pages document right now of a list of all of our policies so that you know what we stand for. And we have so many footnotes on this document. And you know, every time I annoy people so that they could add footnotes, I think we have over you know, a thousand footnotes on this document. And it's my legal background and, and everyone kept on making fun of me, but it's actually super important because people can go and check where the evidence come from, what newspaper published it, whether it's biased or not biased. So we ask people to add the evidence inside. Um, we never had someone, you know, someone sometimes proposed, a few people proposed policies, we've added inside, we said, okay, can you please add it? And then it's accepted by the movement or not in a vote. Um, but if they were not happy with the decision of the policy team, they can appeal. So, I mean, th there's only a couple, tens of thousands of you uh, in the movement, only with uh, sort of heavy scare quotes. Um, and it sort of seems like you've already created a bit of a bureaucratic monster. Um, and I'm just curious how much that slows you down and what the day-to-day -day process is like, both in policy decisions, but also strategy decisions. You know, in um, the startups we advise, sometimes we have first-time founders who come and they're like, oh, we haven't decided who the CEO is yet, and so we're sort of co-CEOs. And we tell them that's a nightmare because good startups tend to be dictatorships. Um, there should be one person who should be making decision at any time because what actually is most likely to kill you isn't a wrong decision, it's making no decision at all, right? Um, in the case of a startup political party, I'm wondering if you have the same thing. So obviously, you don't want to have a dictator, um, but having all these processes of one person, you know, or council checking whether um, this whole vote was okay, and then having a policy team that's checking whether the evidence is actually the evidence, like how do you actually manage the processes? How do you make sure that you can respond quickly uh, to demands? And how do you make sure that you're adapting your strategy um, often enough that you know, you're competitive as a political yeah. party. So when we started it, we spoke to the Pirates Party and it's one of the biggest issues. So sometimes to come up with policies or programs, they take weeks and so we're super scared to do this. I think to start with processes uh, and people call me a bit of a process freak within Volt, but um, it's extremely important exactly not to become a dictatorship. Um, so you know, if you don't have a clear process of who has a, the right to do what, um, then you have people that start to bypass it. And you know, oh, we really need a position so I'm gonna take it. I shouldn't have the power to take it if we're a democratic movement. So we need processes but that, that are um, efficient at the same time so that you can do it quickly. So for a normal policy, you know, we have 
by the way, checking whether it's evidence-based or whatever takes like 10 minutes for the people who do it. Um, so we have normal processes that take sometimes two to three weeks. So people who draft it, it's always open. Uh, you can come in, comment, we have calls and so on. Then we leave it open for a week for comments, to incorporate the comments, and it goes up for votes. So on what? Like the actual thing, is it a Google Doc? Is it So right now it's a Google emails? Doc, but we, it's a Google Doc, which functioned in an okayish manner until now, but having to be the one resolving the comments when you have 4,000 people commenting on a Google Doc, you want to hang yourself. Um, so we switching, uh, we've been developing a... Uh, so everyone has access to all these Google Docs? Yeah. Um, yep. Uh, so imagine there's a drive, <laughs> there's a drive with 4,000 people who yep. have access to your, you know, your entire strategy, entire policy. Yes. Um, so right now there's actually a Google Doc circulating for the second thing that takes three hours um, uh, and I'm going to have to resolve the comments after this so I'm already dreading it. Um, but so because it can be quite burdensome, we are developing a software to automate the creation of policies. Um, so first of all to make it more user friendly because of course if you join uh, and you see a Google Doc with so many comments, you, you don't know where to start. Um, where people can uh, propose policies, uh, the policies are backed by a certain number of people so they go by faster, the comments are prioritized and so on. Um, we've been, it, it was an open source software so we're adapting it to our needs. Um, so it will go faster, but then also, you know, sometimes you need to take an urgent decision and you don't have three weeks to come up with a position. And this is where often participatory parties actually face really difficulties. So we have special mechanisms um, to actually put in place to be able to answer to this. So for example, today we're doing it on a, um, the Franco-German competition rules that want to be amended. Uh, we've been asked to issue a statement. We don't have three weeks to do it, um, so it takes three hours. So basically, you know, we did elect a president, a vice president, and a board that are mandated with taking political decisions. So what we're doing is we do open a Google Doc, we write it, people can comment, comments are incorporated, because when people comment, we get a better solution at the end with more participation. And then the document is um, checked by the policy team to check that it doesn't conflict with any existing policy and adopted by the board. Um, and if the board oversteps in some way, then you can always appeal to the original council, but it takes three hours to have a decision. And how do all these people communicate? So like, I have no idea how traditional, actually that would be a good thing. If you could explain how a tr normal traditional political party works, it's so like how the local chapters coordinate, um, how the chapter leaders communicate, like how does all that stuff work? So I, What's the back end of a political party? So I've never been in a political party before, Walt, so I'm not the best person to say so this. You didn't check best practices. Uh, I did check, so I can tell you what I heard, but I can't tell you firsthand that's, that's how it works. Um, so if you take, for example, En Marche, which was credited for being one of the most participatory parties we have had in France so far, um, you know, you, have, you had, I don't even know how they called it, citizens' councils at the local level where people could propose ideas and then it would go up to the headquarters where in an obscure room people would take decisions on whether to include this, not to include this, who to have on the list, who not to have on the list, and so on, right? So you could propose lots of ideas, you're not sure how it's used. Um, we've involved, we want to make sure that we're transparent, so obviously the policy process I just described, make sure that anyone can participate. But then um, you also have other points. So we work on a platform, online platform, um, which is called Workplace, where everyone has access. So I work with people from every single country every day, and you communicate directly. Uh, so if someone has a problem, uh, they send me a message, or if someone wants to propose something, they send me a message, ask for guidance, we have a quick call, and we discuss how to do it. So it's very horizontal in the sense that, you know, you, you, you literally talk to everyone. Um, and this platform enables you to see also what other countries are doing. So we have country groups on it, you can see. Um, so a very dumb example, but I was in the UK a week ago uh, for the General Assembly, and you know, we have flyers that we distribute in the street to get people to come and um, listen to Volt or come to a meetup or learn more about Volt. They had a really cool flyer. So it wasn't just, you know, two-sided. I know I speak in a weird way about flyers. I'm not obsessed with flyers. It's just a good example. Um, you know, normally it's one side and the other. They actually had one that opened on recycled paper. An edgy flyer. An edgy flyer. It was a really cool flyer, you know, like simple words explaining it really well. I wouldn't have seen it, so I posted it on Workplace, and other countries are beginning to translate it and use it. So you also, as a result, you know, interact more with other countries and see what they do well, what they don't do well, what you can use, what you can't use. Who built Workplace? Because I think this is important. So Facebook built Workplace, and before I say the big bad word, um, Facebook, so we were before on Slack, um, but Slack, you have to pay uh, after a certain number of users, and it's very expensive, uh, and we couldn't afford it, and it's also not very natural for people who don't work in a startup environment to use Slack. Uh, so I used it at work before, uh, but most of our users came and were like, wow, this looks, I don't know how to do this. Workplace, because it looks like Facebook, is more natural, and it actually has um, better uh, data protection um, policies. On the long term, we do want to build our own platform and be completely independent. On the short term, you know, for not-for-profits, it's free. Uh, it has, it's the, one of the best ones for data protection, so we use what we have. And I think it's quite contrarian to be a Facebook-enabled progressive party. You know, you have a few, they don't say it, but you have a few parties on the workplace. Who? 
Um, I don't want to say wrong names, and I had this discussion with uh, Webplace a while ago, uh, but you also have a few French parties on Webplace. Oh, that's cool. Um, and so, actually, so coming back to Facebook, um, so you know, Facebook obviously had very controversial implications, or at least was sort of misused by a couple foreign actors. We don't really know what went on, um, but at least it got a lot of bad press. Another platform that's been used a lot for politics recently is Twitter. Um, and what's interesting with Twitter is that most of the use has been from individuals, right? So Trump, when he's speaking on Twitter, speaks as Trump. He doesn't really necessarily speak as the President of the United States and definitely doesn't speak as a member of the Republican Party. Um, AOC, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, when she's speaking um, on Twitter, speaks you know, as AOC, as a congresswoman, um, but not really as a spokesperson for the Democratic Party. And it seems like you know, these strategies are really outperforming, so putting people instead of parties, um, really pushing them forward. And I'm wondering, you know, because you keep speaking about us and Vault and never me, Colombe, why you're not the European AOC? Um, so first of all, I'm not sure I have what it takes to be the European AOC. Um, so I think there's two elements to it. On a personal note, I feel very uncomfortable in put so, you know, being here is okay, uh, but if I was to speak in, like, I, Colombe, whatever, the whole time, and, and about myself, I would I feel very uncomfortable about AOC it. AOC doesn't just speak about herself. I know, no, no, I know. And I, I, you know, she has an amazing communication strategy on the side and so on. But I, I do feel very uncomfortable. I think you know, it comes with time and I'm learning so much just speaking in front of you guys. Uh, you know, six months ago, I would probably have had to take a shot before. Um, and I actually did it once, so I'm not kidding. Um, it was a bigger room, but you know, it, it's scary. It's, it's really scary. And you, you learn through time, but speaking about yourself in a more personal manner, um, you put yourself more out there, it's more scary, I don't feel confident enough to do it many, most of the time. So there's the personal element to it. Then the other element is, you know, politics for us is not about a man or a woman, it's about a party. And I think very quickly, when you have people hijacking, um, and I'm not saying it's what <coughs> AOC does, but in France it's often what's done. Um, and you see it, for example, with Emmanuel Macron, uh, En Marche, uh, EM, EM. Um, you know, a party being all about one person, and it's the case of En Marche, but it's the case of many other parties. You know, Mélenchon is the head figure and will always represent um, his party, Le Pen as well. Um, it means that the, the project can't necessarily work on the long term. So the aim of Volt, I never wanted to do politics, and I never wanted to do politics, and Damien never wanted to do politics. The aim of Volt has never been to put us on the front scene. Um, we've been all elected as head um, of the list, so we are de facto, but it was never about us, and it will never be about us again. So we want this to go beyond us. I want to go back to your normal life after, I want to go back to my old job as well, um, and I don't want to stay in politics. And vote has to survive beyond me, and this is why we're putting in place such democratic structures as well, to make sure that it survives. And if you make it only about a few people, there's no way it can actually work on the long term. And then it means you believe more in yourself than in the ideas you're trying to convey. So I think, of course, there's a balance because people relate more with people rather than parties. Um, and I'm not sure we completely found the balance so far. I think that because we're beginning to elect all of our lists, so we elected the heads of the list in France, we elected an entire list in Italy, an entire list in Germany, an entire list in the Netherlands. Um, this weekend, we're electing Belgium, and it's going slowly. We're electing more and more people. So you will have faces that will become more relatable um, and speak up more. But I don't know where as a party you also put, it's something I'm still struggling with. Um, and I know we talked about it and you saw it in one of my blogs. I'm really struggling with knowing how personal I can be, um, how much I should put myself in front of it and so on. But we definitely don't want to have the whole spotlight on us rather than the ideas and uh, what we convey. Because I think part of what people appreciate and people putting themselves forward is that they're taking some form of personal risk. So there's this common perception that you know, politicians are just there abusing their power, um, making the most of the privileges that they're given, and that at the end of the day, they're not putting that much at risk, despite the fact that they're telling everyone how to live their lives. And so I think that you know, when you're speaking as yourself and not hiding, not that I'm saying that you're hiding, but not you know, using the vault and putting, putting vault up front, people appreciate that. Um, and you know, I think it's a pretty efficient communication strategy. And so I'm wondering, given that that's not the focus, or you're in the hybrid model, finding, your, finding yourself uh, in terms of communication strategy, what, it, you know, what you're actually focusing on. So there's this common um, saying in startup world that first-time founders focus too much on product. And in your case, it was a 212-page document, 212 document with 1,000 footnotes. Um, the product seems pretty settled. And that second-time founders focus mostly on distribution. And so I'm wondering, as a political party that's just starting up, um, what your main distribution channels are. So how do you get your ideas across? Yeah. So going back just one second to you know um, the comms strategy. So we actually hired um, communication firms who all told us founders put yourself in front. It's what works. Um, so everyone keeps on saying the same thing, and you know there must be a point to it. And I I, I get you're it. Not stubborn. That, you're not that stubborn. I'm not stubborn. That <laughs> 
No, but there is a point to it. You know, clearly it works, and we've seen it in political parties. I think we need to find a balance. I think we all, and it's true, it's easier often to say vault than me or Gnome, and it's true that I put myself less out there this way. I completely agree with it. I think we do risk a lot. Um, you know, go, going back to human rights after having done politics is almost impossible. Um, we compromised. Uh, you stained your image forever. Yeah. It was a really tough decision for this as well. It's, you know, you fight against government and then suddenly you become the bad guy. So it's, it's, it's a hard move back. Um, and for the others as well, you know, we risked our financial security, uh, our jobs, our career, and it's not like it's an easy road back um, from politics to something else. So we do put ourselves at risk, but it's true that maybe we do hide a bit be behind the whole thing. However, I do see a real danger in uh, hijacking the whole thing. For those elections, maybe it will work better, maybe we'll get more seats, maybe we'll be elected, but then what? You know, we elected four years, eight years, and then what? How does it survive beyond us? We're not going to be there forever, um, and, and we need more. We need people at the local, national level, so what happens? Um, then on how we get our ideas across, so the thing I vote is it's not about funders. We created it, but we made sure that we don't have more of a voice than other people as well, so that everyone can, again, propose ideas and vote. Um, right now, with the campaign, I'm focusing less on the 12, 212 pages document, although I really like to focus on it, um, and more on you know, doing more events across France. So we started a tour of France. In the north of France, we're going to do um, the whole country slowly, um, slowly because it's expensive to do it continuously, and it's extremely tiring because we sleep on the couches and on the floor of um, vault people that are kind, kind enough to let us stay for the night. Um, so we're doing this, we're trying to have, uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one conversations, we're meeting different stakeholders, so we met, oh, you know, we met CSOs, um, civil society um, associations, we're meeting many, many stakeholders, uh, trying to get our ideas across, trying to do more media, uh, having more press coverage, speaking more at this type of events, uh, so I guess this is more the distribution side of it, um, that will happen until the elections, and then we'll go back for a bit, um, to the internal structuring, so of course after an election, especially if we get people elected, we'll have to restructure somehow. Um, so we already have a governance task force thinking of how to operate as an elected political party um, to give people a voice on how the people they elected are behaving as well. Um, what do you think is Vault's most radical uh, proposal? So you know, we have a, you, you're, I, I read one of your speeches and you said take responsibility and give it all you have, or give, um, I'm wondering what, in terms of proposals, give it all you have. So I think just the fact, radical intense. So this too, I think just the fact that we're running on one single program across the EU has never been done. So we keep on making jokes about, you know, the last time it was done, but having a detailed political program, so we have a program that is not a manifesto, it's not vague, we have specific positions, and it's nine pages, not 212 pages, um, but because I really struggle to keep things short, uh, we also have a supporting document where we explain exactly what directives and regulations we can change uh, to make our things happen, and which funds are available to, um, to actually push for it, so that you know, it's not just proposing ideas, we show it's possible. Um, and the fact of doing a campaign in at least seven countries on one program, and showing that you, know, you have European solutions to many problems, whether it's job creation, um, migration, climate change, rights, etc., has never been done before. And this is radical. And everyone is telling us that we're absolutely crazy to do it because people won't relate with one single program. We've seen that people actually relate because there's something for everyone in there. Uh, we have three main axes. The first one is the reform of the European Union. Um, you know, I talked about the right of legislative initiative, so being able to propose a law. Um, this needs to be done, whatever country you come from. The second is creating um, an economic powerhouse in the EU that uh, is sustainable. Um, so using EU funds to create jobs, um, to create lifelong trainings. And the third one is having a just and um, responsible uh, union. So we talk about equal rights and so on. And in this, whatever country you come from, you will find something. So if I ask any of you what your main concern is, by the way, generally in Europe, it's security, jobs, and housing. We have a solution to this. Um, and it's never been done, and it shows that we can actually do politics as one. Then the most radical policy in itself, uh, I mean, it depends on your personal um, feelings. So for me, because I come from a human rights background, it tends to be equal rights for all, and making sure that, for example, women have exactly the same rights than men, whether it's in France, Poland, Italy, Bulgaria, or Romania, uh, so the right of abortion everywhere, or other rights. But it might be, for can example... Can you list the countries where that's still not the case? Not to put you on the spot, the fact like some yeah. countries where it's not the case. So for example, in Poland, you don't have the right of abortion, but it's not only having the legal right. So in many countries, it's actually very limited. So in Sicily, which is you know, one of the big islands in Italy, you have one doctor providing abortions, one doctor. So it's legal, in practice, it's completely illegal. You can't actually get an abortion. In France, in many regions, you don't have hospitals providing abortions. So it's great to have the right. If you can't use it, it's completely pointless. Um, and it's so the people case make fun of the many US states and Planned Parenthood said, but uh, it's actually not that much better here. 
I mean, the US is a bit more extreme because sometimes you actually have to drive 14 hours to get uh, to an abortion clinic in another state and they manage to pass ridiculous laws like if, you <coughs> corridor, if the corridor of the hospital is not 1 meter 37 instead of, you know, 1 meter 35, you can't keep your abortion uh, center open. But, yeah? but in many countries, it's just illegal. So in Poland, it's just illegal. In Ireland, until recently, it was illegal. Um, so for me, this is a radical proposal to make sure that we all have equal rights. And I'm talking about abortion, but I could be talking about any other rights, you know, the right to marry whomever you love. Um, you know, the right to seek refuge in a country and to have the right to work from day one. So in France, you're a refugee, you can't work from the first day. It's not only very dumb in terms of uh, finances for the state because they have to pay for allocations and you don't contribute to the economy. It means that people can't actually integrate, can't start their lives over, um, and it doesn't help anyone. Um, but then, for example, for some other people, the reform of the European Union, so the fact that we want to change the institutions from the inside, we want to make sure that parliamentarians get a right to represent you. We want to, you know, put defense uh, at a European level, so create a European army, and share more intelligence, go towards a more federal Europe. This might be said in some countries, and in, it, it depends on your personal beliefs, that it's more radical. What happens after the European election for a vault? So the aim has never been just the European elections. To be honest, when we started it, we didn't even think of the European elections because we didn't know when the European elections were. Uh, it was available, we just didn't evolve in the, in the circle. Um, so very quickly we found out when it was, and it was a good point. I mean, you Googled it. Yeah, I Googled it. I mean, I Googled, you know, I still Google often how Europe actually works. I studied EU law, but still, you know, often it's, it's complicated, and I Googled the dates of the elections, how you vote, uh, you know, how you participate. I Googled all of this, watch YouTube videos and so on. Uh, and we also have experts in the moment. And by the way, it's not that we do have experts that know also and worked in the institutions and so on. Um, but it's never been, the aim has never been just the European elections. It fell at a good moment because it enables us to develop as one party in a coherent manner. Um, so the fact that we're running in at least seven countries means that we're running together as one movement. We have a common aim and, you know, we're way more connected this way than if we were only to run at the local level. But in France, um, in 2020, we have the municipal elections. So we're going to be running in the municipal elections. Um, the same day than the European elections, you have regional and federal elections in Belgium. We're running in both. Uh, we're going to be running in municipal and regional elections in Italy. Um, and slowly we want to run at every single level of government um, to make sure that we can represent citizens in the best way at every level. So before we open up to questions, I have three small ones. Um, the first one is what makes you most optimistic about Europe, mm -hmm. um, not just you know, as a set of institutions, but also as a continent. Um, the second is about, you, know, you, you keep mentioning your life after Volt, and I'm curious what, you know, what, how you 10x your ambition um, after having created the first pan-European party. Um, and the last is about someone that you look up to as an inspiring figure, man or woman, politician or not. What's the first question again? The first question was, what makes you, what makes you optimistic about Europe? Um, so for me, one of the main things that has actually, and that keeps me going, because you know, it's not easy every day. Um, you take a lot of slaps in your face, people are very aggressive on social media. Um, it's not easy to grow necessarily, um, it's the members. And I'm not just saying this because a few of you, of you are in the room, so I'm forced to say it. And it's also because it's true. So we have, quite, we, had, we have close to 100 members that quit their jobs or post their studies to do this full time. So often it tends to be members that worked for a few years so can actually afford to do it. But you know, the fact that you're willing to put a stop to your life for quite a few months. Because that's something that you didn't mention. How are you funded? Just yep. I add that. That's a sort of three and a half question. <laughs> okay, so I'll mention it just after this one. Um, so the fact that people are willing to invest so much in this project is extremely inspiring. And the thing that keeps on coming back is, you know, we don't have a choice. So if we don't do it now, most likely, and I hope it's not going to be the case, but most likely um, on the 26th of May, the parliament is going to change and we're going to have extremists, nationalists, and um, very scary people governing the European Union for the next uh, 50 years. Oh, five years, sorry, 50 years, whoa. <laughs> um, for the next five years. And something, I'm saying 50 because it's the next number I want to say, um, something that we actually don't think of enough is the fact that national laws are heavily impacted by the European laws. So at least 30% of national laws come from European laws, but sometimes it goes to 50 this is why the 50 years, by the way, I'm not thinking of a European dictatorship. Um, so the fact that people are willing to take this risk, and it's a risk, you know, they really put themselves in front of the line, and they stop many of the things they're doing, it's all-consuming, you work way too much, it's also exhilarating, and you work with incredible people, but it's, it's a tough thing to do, is the thing that gives me the most hope about our generation and um, the future. Second, how we funded, um, so we're super transparent on donation, um, mainly crowdfunding, 95% crowdfunding, um, so we put different crowdfunders online asking for salaries, asking for something and so on, and we raise funds. 
Um, of course, we want uh, higher donations, um, and we had just a few, but any time we have a donation that goes above 3,000 euros, we disclose it on our website with the name of the person. Of course, the person has to consent to it, otherwise we send back the money. Um, and this was super important to us so that people can know uh, what interests lie in vault. And one thing, in France it's legal to accept corporate donations. It's not illegal in most other European countries. We took the decision very early on not to accept corporate donations, not to be lobbied too much one way or another. We tend to make our lives so much easier in vote, but yeah, not to be, uh, to, to be lobbied one, one way or another. And so where does the money actually go? Because you can't have a European party, so they can't give to that. Um, in France, you don't even have a bank account, so how do you make donations? So, so where does the money go? So, yeah, money transfers for political parties and pan-European political parties is a living hell. Um, in some countries, you can actually transfer money to national parties. Uh, in France, it's obviously completely illegal. Uh, but so we spend it, for example, we have a congress in Rome um, on the 23rd of March with a thousand people coming. So on this, on operating the European team, so we hired a few people, um, mainly candidates, so we're not, now not hired by Volt anymore, but um, we hired a few people for a couple of months. Um, so the salaries, offices, um, social media advertising for our Volt Europa pages, um, but then we try to fundraise mainly at the national level otherwise. Okay, back to the two questions that I, I initially asked. Um, so the, the next one being, what's next, and how do you 10x your ambition on uh, after having created the first pan-European party, and the last one, one person you look up to? What's next? Um, so we hope to be elected in the first place. I hope to be elected. Um, if it's not the case, I have absolutely no idea. Uh, being completely honest, um, it's hard to go back to an old job from this. Um, it's such a weird model of operation, you know, at, at 24, directing a policy team and then running. Um, I think I'm going to take holidays that I haven't taken in, in, in two years, sleep and think about it. So this is in, in four years' time after you're elected? If, yeah, if I'm elected. If not, I'm taking a, <laughs> a couple of weeks of holidays and sleeping. Um, but yeah, otherwise, I don't know. We'll see. And the young person, actually, person that you look up to, and then if he or she isn't young, a young person that you look up to. And you can't say Adrien because he's not that inspiring. I know, I was thinking that since you started by saying that, you know, he talked about me, I felt a bit obliged, but if he's not that inspiring, he's or very... Victor, ins or Victor. Okay, so the two are extremely inspiring in the room, and I'm not objective because they're my best sense, but I do think that they're some of the most inspiring people I know. Um, one of my previous bosses at the Kennedy Foundation um, is a Colombian woman um, who taught me literally so much. So I didn't realize when I got in, uh, for example, all of the times I was interrupted as a woman, all of the times I couldn't actually speak up. Speak up. I thought that I was young, not American, with an accent. Um, so obviously, you know, people had the right to behave a certain way towards me. And she managed to do it. So I'm stubborn, but I'm also quite direct, um, which can sometimes put people off. So, you know, when something happens, I'm very direct about it. And she managed to do it in such a subtle way, get her points across um, and get exactly to where she wanted, that she taught me, I think, more in a couple of months than uh, many, many people. And a young person, or younger than you? And then that's my last question. Um, if you don't have one, that's fine. I think, for example, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to sound a bit, uh, you know, normal to say at this time, but the students that started the um, uh, climate marches across Europe, or the students that decided to stand up against gun violence in the US. But it's not one person in particular, and this, I think, is what we need to remember in this generation as well. It's just people who are willing to start something, and then others join and act on a daily basis to get their points across. Um, and you see those people that are 14 to 16 years old, um, and who actually changed the future of their countries and of their continents. And I know one in Volt, um, his name is Angelos, he joined when he was 16, I think, uh, when we started Volt, um, Greek, um, and he's been one of the most amazing policy writers we had, and we have people that have worked in the commission. And More footnotes than you? Uh, yeah, I think, and I think the guy will be present, you know, he will be way more amazing than I am and so on. Um, but, you know, you, you see these people, literally, he couldn't come to any of our assemblies because he was a minor. Um, of course, we have parental approval, but, you know, he was a minor and so on. Um, and who are winning, but he's just an example, you know. There's so many of us who are willing to literally work every day after high school instead of going out with their friends or doing something to change things. Again, inconceivable stuff 20 years ago. Uh, before we open up to questions, I'd like all of you to thank Colum for coming. Um, and give a big round. Thank you for having me. Good luck on the lead. Good luck on the lead.